Ke te whare, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko uh, Ruapehu tō maunga. Ko Manuatu tu awa. Ko Nati Tuma tauanga te iwi. Ko te kura o Napaka o Aotearoa o e mahi ahi. Mahi ana. Ko Peter Wood toku enua. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, really pleased to be here, uh, finally after a bit of a journey, uh, Kingsley. Uh, listen to a, a, a wonderful range of talks from uh, interesting perspectives, including art, uh, academics, and uh, it's been it's been truly wonderful. And like Martin, I've you know I've been busily jotting down points from all the talks, Ruth's this morning. There's an intersect between what I'm going to talk about Angola and Ruth's experiences in Timor Leste. Um, I'd just like to note, particularly as we're heading into uh, to uh, Anzac, uh, just like to acknowledge uh, those uh, veterans or those others of you in the audience, and you know who you are, who've been uh, to war zones in the course of your uh, studies or deployments or work, uh, just acknowledge uh, your service. and. Probably I could get any one of you to come down here and talk about your experiences. There'd be some things that'd be the same, but everybody's experience is vastly different, including people who went on the same mission a year apart, or others of us who just changed over, and I'll quote one of my uh, colleagues who followed me into Angola a little bit later. So Adam uh, talked about policy. Uh, Martin's talked about the operational level. And as uh, John mentioned, I'm going to talk about the grassroots experience of those who are sent into harm's way. Uh, we don't just volunteer to go there ourselves and send ourselves. Decisions have been taken um, by Cabinet ultimately, but with the consultation of other government departments and the Defence Force, and kind of like, away we go. I've been on a number of operations. I'm only going to talk about the first and the last but you can kind of see through the image there, the unarmed peacekeeper, the lightly armed peacekeeper in Timor, and then finally the uh, fully armed, body armoured, pistoled and rifled uh, uh, experience in, uh, in, in my last mission. And there we all are, standing outside the bombed out Bath headquarters, which was in the middle of our uh, Ford operating base in Baghdad. Um, New Zealand's been involved in peace support operations for a long time, with over 40 missions supported. And uh, I, I'm going to come back at the end to the statement made, made by Doug Hammarskjöld that peacekeeping is not a job for soldiers. It's certainly one we can do, but only soldiers can do it. And I think the proof's already in the room that there are certainly other people who've been deployed, New Zealanders, uh, in support of uh, operations overseas who are not actually members of the Defence Force, now the police have been mentioned, MFAT and the like. It's way more comprehensive. So I'm going to just quickly uh, talk about where New Zealanders have been since 1975. Very quickly zip you through uh, pre-deployment training, the kind of training we do before we go. Talk to my two missions, my experience, and not the opinion necessarily of the Defence Force, thanks John. Uh, some post-deployment considerations and just a couple of observations. So that's where we've been. I've put that one up twice. I'm not sure which is, is that white or black? That one's good? All right, so um, these are in reverse alphabetical order. That's my numpty computer skills. But Syria, <laughs> uh, a very short, probably the NZDF's shortest uh, mission and attempt in 2012 to intervene uh, along with other nations in Syria, you know, and over a decade later, you know, uh, yeah. The Solomons, about 1,650 New Zealanders, including nearly 500 police have been deployed. Um, similar, you know, in uh, Bougainville, Sinai is another long-standing mission since 1981. Big numbers, and they used to even include a uh, helicopter detachment. Iraq, where the NZDF is still represented, despite the withdrawal of the training team in 2020. East Timor stands out, of course, uh, is our largest deployment since 1975, with some 6,000 New Zealanders from across the three services being deployed. Uh, Afghanistan also stands out, as Martin's talked about, 
with more than 3,000 people uh, going on that particular mission. The Defence Force estimates that about 18,000 New Zealanders have actually served on deployments since 1975, and I would argue that the bulk of them have actually been since 1990 and possibly since sort of 2001. So uh, the, uh, the, the UN uh, Military Observer, the UNMO, the Unarmed Peacekeeper, I, I wrote them up there, but my successor actually published a book. I haven't, so I'll have to quote from his. He talked about uh, the UNMO. Um, UNMOs deploy as individuals rather than as a group or in a contingent. They operate in small international groups, often drawn from countries with completely different professional ethics. They are normally unarmed, almost always, and rely on previously warring factions to provide a secure environment. The unknown's world is often one of danger and uncertainty, of venturing into the unknown, being exposed to random violence, and making it up as they go along. Often they are left to fend for themselves, with limited access to logistic and medical support. So it's quite different, and this is why I'm looking at the what I would call the minor missions. That's not to say that they were not worth considering, it's simply to say that unlike the larger missions where you're with a large group of New Zealanders who you know and they know you and there's a support network in the mission, you are basically out there on your own. And even in Angola, there were three of us in that massive country you saw on Ruth's slide before. We were by UN policy sent to different team sites and locations. That's just the way it works. So you really truly are on your own. A standard deployment is about six months, and you can get anything from three to six months warning. Um, you go on what we call PDT, pre-deployment training. It's about three weeks. The first week, you're learning about the mission, the intelligence picture there, the risks. You do close quarter combat, uh, challenging when you're a bit older, and uh, you even have a couple of days with your whanau and the other members of the pre-deployment with psychologists talking about the the psychological aspects of departure, mission, what they're going to go through, and then uh, reunion. Week two, more practical skills, how to deal with uh, landmines, booby traps, basic first aid so you can look after yourself, and hopefully you're not going to need this, but dealing with gunshot and blast injuries. And then finally, week three, if you're going on a mi uh, mission like we were there, where you're going to be armed, Lots of shooting at close range at fleeting targets. Uh, instinctive type shooting uh, is done for a whole week there. We finished our PDT on Friday and we departed for Iraq on the Tuesday immediately afterwards. I'm now going to quickly go through the two missions. So uh, Angola, I travelled there uh, myself and returned myself. Something, you know, like Ruth talked about this morning, um, Portugal colonised Angola in 1575. Uh, there was a war of independence uh, in the lead up to 1974. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when Portugal withdrew, as they did from Angola, Mozambique, Timor, uh, those factions that had formed up then went and fought each other. The MPLA was supported by Cuba and the Russians. And the UNITA, the, the guys in the area that I ended up being uh, sent to, they were supported by the United States and South Africa. So basically you had the Cold War being uh, played out, and they gave them all the toys, as you'll see. The mission itself went through various iterations, looks good on the slide, but there were huge gaps, lots of fighting between, and as you'll find out, you know, ultimately it was unsuccessful. But when I got there in the last thing there, our job was to disarm, demobilise and repatriate UNITA guerrillas back uh, and then hand over their territory uh, to the government area. So uh, you'll see on the map on the left the vertical lines, that's the territory that the UNITA held and that my team site was down, uh, down in here uh, and so there up on the border was Zambia and Botswana and typically the UN uh, uh, they'll set up a headquarters as they did here in Lawanda, force headquarters, big headquarters, air conditioning, all that stuff. And then they'll have a number of regions. Each region has a, uh, a regional headquarters where I was eventually based. 
my team site here, and I'll show you it shortly. And this guy, Savimbi, who's in charge of Yanita, he's just down in Jamba, so he can get across the border if he needs to to escape the forces. So that's kind of like the, the lay down there. Halfway through a six month tour, you're normally by policy in the UN rotated to another location or team site. As a New Zealander, of course, you wanted to stay out in the field, so the best option was another team site, maybe to your regional headquarters. If you are unlucky, you got sent back or you went back to Luanda, although some people from other countries would actually quite like to be back in Luanda. So when you arrive, there's the shot out of the, uh, the aircraft as we're coming down, and you get into Luanda, typical Portuguese kind of beachfront looks pretty good, but the reality is a whole lot different more than 20 years of civil war and other fighting. Every, once the Portuguese left, everything is gone. There's no sewage, there's no water, there's no electricity, buildings are crumbling. The place just stinks of uh, smoke, diesel fumes, feces, everything. It's just appalling. And it's not much better when you get out into the uh, out of a thing. You can't walk or drive, you have to fly. But everywhere, Angola is a uh, country of rivers. They're all down, all knocked out. Armoured vehicles everywhere, given to them by the Soviets and the others. This one's been taken off the road by the force of the explosion that blew it off the side of the road. That aircraft, I had to zoom in to get it. You would not walk to it. You might just step on a landmine. And of course, here we are in a nun's cell, her quarters. It's full of ammunition now. There's ammunition and landmines throughout the country. It's like Slash in the New Zealand environment in Tairawhiti. It's made the land unusable there, and it will be so for, for many more years, I would think, in Angola. You get to your team site out in the middle of nowhere. We were just off the end of a runway. South Africans used to fly up there to go hunting. But now it's in the middle of nowhere. It was a Unita base, so we're just there. There's no village nearby. That's what it looks like. You're just on the sand in a couple of tents. Uh, security is provided by uh, one strand of barbed wire two uh, locals that sleep under there, and then we've got a, a captive, well, we didn't capture him, the Unita captured uh, this guy here, and he, Elias, is our cook and helper, and by about week two of a month, we're running out of food, so we buy a goat, he kills it, and we have rice and goat, or goat and rice, depending, it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like the variation, and if the power goes off, as it did, then you are basically... Uh, camping out there on your own. Pretty austere conditions. And sort of a job, what are the hazards? Well, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of hazards. There's the uh, wildlife, so scorpions, uh, landmines. The guys on the right have lost an arm and a leg each. But the real threat to us, apart from the driving, was this fellow in the, minute, uh, in the middle, Chituma. He's the UNITA commander, supposedly demobilised, but he actually controls 500 UNITA guerrillas that are uh, nearby to our area who we are supposedly going to disarm and demobilise and send home. Uh, but I think he and uh, Mr Savimbi have other plans. So what is the mahi for us? We oversee the weapons recovery. In this case, the UN police I mean, have come in. Uh, they're supervised by UN off, uh, staff, and they're handing them those weapons. And the Russian pilots on the right-hand side of the right-hand picture are sort of picking through. They would recognise most of them because they're of Soviet origin and they're going to fly them back to the capital so they can't be reused. But uh, the question we should have asked is, where are all the modern weapons? We transitioned the UNITA area slowly over to the, to the government. Uh, little ceremonies, we'd fly down in their Russian helicopter. They would drink uh, vodka copiously while we were at our handover meeting, and then they'd fly us back. But uh, what we... You know, on reflection, we were actually sending the few police and the government administrator basically to their deaths because when uh, the war kicked off again, they would have been the first uh, to, be, to be killed. And the other thing we did was we oversaw the repatriation of, uh, well, you know, there's some kids about to get on an aircraft, both got their chooks in the back, uh, and we load them into the aeroplane, uh, and there's no seats. Military aircraft, they've taken all the seat sets, you can cram in the people, they sit there, <laughs> off they go. Uh, the old guy, the guy there in the green, uh, probably ex-guerrilla, but with crutches. But the, the thing is, where's the fighting age men? Chitilma's not releasing them, and we didn't think about that. 
when all this was going on. We were careful to protect them from Chituma, but we didn't know that he was holding back uh, the fighters. We got, I got involved in uh, the local community. This is the Likua village, and my job was to convince the Zambian battalion to release a couple of trucks and take them into the forest with some of the local guys who cut down all the wood that you can see there so that we could then, or they could build uh, the roof to their hospital and cover it over with tin rather than that fat stuff that they'd had there. And you just try and get involved to build the trust with the locals, what is it you need, and then you work with others to try and make it so. And then partway through the mission, about the three-month mark, I've got the message, uh, two messages really, uh, you're going back to the regional headquarters and you're now going to be there an extra three months. So my six months became nine months. This is all I'm going to uh, say about the regional headquarters, simply to point out the fact that you know, you're know you working with a whole range by design of the UN of people with different skills, attitudes and everything. Uh, the guy from Guinea-Bissau, he can't speak English. So you've immediately got a challenge you know, with some of your staff who are not prepared to work 24-7 or do what's required or won't accompany you uh, to a trouble spot, uh, and you've got to work your way through all of that. Now, there were some other staff, uh, UN uh, human rights officers, political affairs officers, administrators and that, but that was my military staff, you know. Uh, yeah, it was interesting times and very frustrating. And the outcome, well, essentially the mission failed uh, the Civil War resumed, and it didn't actually end until Savimbi was killed by the Angolan army. Then, of course, as the newspaper clipping says, there was a bit of worry about what they might do, but fortunately, the new leadership of New Unita decided to actually demilitarise and enter into the political realm. So in a country of 16 million, uh, somewhere between 1.5 and maybe 2 million people were either killed or displaced by the war, and meanwhile, the country's infrastructure, public institutions and economy were devastated. So I quickly transitioned on to uh, Operation Inherent Resolve. This was uh, an, uh, a mission that was stood up in response to the rapid rise of the um, IS, ISIS. 74 countries, there we are, just one of a whole lot of countries there. American led. Of course, ISIS, IS, Daesh gained, gained global attention, some shocking stuff on the television. They quickly overwhelmed the Iraqi security forces, and then a number of provincial military forces uh, were stood up to help defeat IS, and many of them were stood up and influenced by Iran. Something that we never paid much attention to probably was in 2015. Uh, uh, sorry, in 2018, President Donald Trump uh, basically withdrew the US from a, a nuclear deal and that greatly angered Iran. Um, yeah. But ISIS's ability uh, to... They're in the media, but their real fighting capability and their territorial hold had much shrunk even by the time that I'd got to Iraq. Our mission was really not to do the fighting. The fighting was to be done by the Iraqi security forces, army, federal police, border guards, counterterrorism services. Our job was to support them in this by the provision of intelligence, equipment, money so they could pay their soldiers, that kind of stuff, and uh, to, so that we could eventually uh, pave the way not only to crush IS, but to have long-term security relationships with the Iraqi security forces. Up the top, that's Manawa. That's the hundred or so New Zealand trainers that were there. They're doing a, you know, haka, typical New Zealand stuff. But going on as the two missions, the two um, Manawa rotations challenged each other on the way in and the way out. But uh, we were just, you know, five of us uh, in the in the green zone there with the Bath headquarters, as I explained earlier, our mohua. So completely different from my experience in, in Angola. Suddenly we're in a base in the green zone. We're protected by blast walls, so you can't get hit by IEDs, bombs, rockets, bullets. Uh, security provided, there's an you know, American vehicle with a cannon on top. 
that's on the inside of our gate being guarded by Iraqis. So if anybody comes through, you're now in a headquarters of, well, no longer just the eight of us, uh, several hundred. And we even had Overwatch. So rather than flimsy barbed wire, we got, there's a door gunner on a Spanish uh, gunship. Yep. Uh, our living conditions were somewhat superior. Uh, somewhat like a jail, you had an individual room with air conditioning, a shower. Uh, we were doing marako, uh, you know, traditional Maori sort of fighting uh, under one of our Maori officers who was part of our contingent. Uh, Red Cross parcels arrived from the RSA. Instead of an eight-week, I was explaining to John, the eight-week out-and-back mail cycle I faced in, in uh, Angola. You know, we even got parcels and stuff coming up. And, you know, food was of a pretty good standard not just the pizzas and fries that I was expecting out of an American base. It was excellent. What were, our, what were our tasks? Well, our job was basically to liaise with senior Iraqi officers to schedule battalions and brigades of Iraqi security forces through the training camps, one of which was Taji, where New Zealanders worked closely with Australians, but also there were Spanish, Brits and Americans on the base as well. And... My role specifically was to monitor the development of the Iraqi security forces and their capability to uh, defeat IS. But the real threat to us was actually not posed by the Islamic State. It was these guys, members ex nominally of the Iraqi security forces. These are the Shia militia groups. They're supposed to be inside the Iraqi security forces. There's probably 60,000 of them. But even though nominally they're commanded by this Iraqi uh, senior officer, Abdul Mahdi al Muhandis from Iraq, the real boss is this fellow, General Qasim Soleimani, who's the head of the uh, Quds Force, which is the Iranian extraterritorial operations that's supporting other uh, things, and including the Shia uh, militia groups. <laughs> I guess with the tearing up of, uh, of that uh, deal uh, and anything else, of course, the aim of perhaps Iran and definitely the Shia militia groups was to target American bases and they just painted us in, all of us, all other 73 parts of the organisation. We're just part of the American organisation and the biggest and most symbolic target in Baghdad inside the green zone was that US embassy. It's large, it's their biggest one. And coincidentally, our base was right alongside it. And if you know anything about rockets, uh, they, well, these ones are fairly crude. These uh, Katusha rockets, you will have seen them on the television in Ukraine, being fired either by Russians or Ukrainians, generally off the back of trucks and salvos. Well, these fellows couldn't get that sort of thing in, so they jerry-rig up uh, one or two launches or maybe more and try them, fire them in on big targets like uh, the embassy or potentially uh, onto Al-Assad or other bases, Taji even got its share of rocket fire. So we had a deterioration. We never expected this. We, um, check it on the time. We, um, at Christmas, you know, we thought the mission was just pr proceeding really nicely. But uh, on the 27th, a couple of days after that, Marako, uh, the a rocket killed an American on a base. And that led to the Americans to make a strike against the Shia militia groups they believed were responsible. And their retaliation was to storm en masse into the green zone onto the US embassy. And the noise, the, everything that was going on, and then overnight when finally the Iraqi counterterrorism service had cleared out the SMGs was the constant clatter of helicopters as they flew in reinforcements from the Americans and flew out members of the uh, US Embassy. Everything went quiet after that. I, thought, I got a phone call, 6 o'clock in the morning, from the New Zealand ambassador. Hey, Peter, something's gone on. You know, she called me on the cell phone, go and check it out. So I rushed down there. Oh, yep. Uh, what had happened is the Americans have now done a missile strike and killed both Soleimani and Mohandas in the same strike. So they've killed the senior Iraqi as well as a senior Iranian officer. And so 
Uh oh, and it was pretty much doom and gloom there in the in the in the in the mission and in the headquarters as we wondered what the reaction would be. The Iraqis stopped all interaction with us, and we likewise stopped all interaction with them because we were now focusing on force protection, constant wearing of body armor, helmets, only moving in pairs, all that sort of routine. And in order to lower the threat. Uh, of casualties on our little base, about 500 of us were evacuated out of Baghdad by helicopter at night. And so sometimes when you go on one of these missions and things are happening and going nicely, suddenly, as General White put it, they go sideways and you are in actually a completely different country. So there's a nighttime evacuation, uh, blacked out Chinook helicopters, sort of of, um, you know, flying over Baghdad in the dark to avoid missiles and ground fire. You land at an airfield and it's pitch black and they shove you basically into the, into the bowels of a big American aircraft. Again, a repeat of my experience in Angola. Suddenly, though, I was the one sitting on the floor with all my gear and we were just crammed into that thing for the one-hour flight down to Kuwait. So we get off the aircraft and just to give you a size, a sense of the size of the forces involved, each of those little uh, white numbered rectangles is an 80-person barracks of, of uh, 10 eight-man bunk rooms, you know. And they can, 6,000 people, they can house in this kind of transit accommodation. That's the scale that, you know, of, of the Americans have. And this is the new office, though. Basically, bunk, my own laptop, and then you type up an unclassified message back to New Zealand to let them what's not going on because they didn't know. And then you go off to get the welfare internet connection and send a quick message back. Hey, we're safe, but we're in a different country now, and we need to make some uh, like new arrangements. Of course, uh, we knew, and this is the reason we were being evacuated, that uh, Iran would have some utu, and they did. Uh, they launched a number of ballistic missiles at Iraq, probably you know, upwards of 16 or more. Mostly, though, they hit the Al-Assad airbase and caused a significant amount of damage and uh, destruction there. But mercifully, because they'd been able to follow the tracks of the missiles but not shoot them down, uh, they were able to clear most of the people out of the base. But because they figured that it would be followed up by a ground assault, they still had to leave some people there and there were, for instance, a significant number of traumatic brain injuries from the blast of a ballistic missile. Fortunately, well, there probably would have been more, but I'm not sure if you remember it. Um, the Iranians accidentally shot down an airliner over Tehran, and most of the casualties were their own people, the passengers. And then they had to deal with not only the international uh, grief over this, but their own people inside Iran uh, so they, they, they basically, that was the end of the, of the thing. A few more rocket attacks into Baghdad, but that was the end of it all. So the outcome, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. We had optimism or before. Uh, why? Uh, well, already the Iraqi security forces showed during that freeze that they were willing to step up and operate on their own. They didn't need all the training. The trainers all left. And then lessons from Afghanistan when and if to withdraw, not in a hurry and not during the summer, the fighting season, you know, wait. Uh, but also, I think, quite possibly, Iran currently doesn't actually want um, IS to become another factor in, in the country next door. So there's probably a number of reasons here. So I'm quietly optimistic there that, that will, the, the mission will actually work. When you get back, big mission, yeah, maybe the Minister of Defence, Chief of Army, to be there, senior officers, big hoo-ha. Uh, when you're on a minor mission, that's your, that's Rebecca Wood. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it. Um, you know, reunion with families is awkward. You, you, mm. Yep. Getting back into work can be a problem. Uh, recognition, it's not an issue. You, you know, sort of you, you get medals and stuff, but... I think uh, often it's your own colleagues. You know, you get back there, hey, I've just, you know, I'm back from Iraq. And they say, yeah, okay, good, right. This is what we're doing. And, and you, 
it's yeah, it, it, it takes you a while to get over it, and then it also takes you a while for you to stop thinking about the mission, trying not to remember mm -hmm. about it. So some observations, I guess, from the field. You know, we can't, when we go there, and neither, neither can the Cabinet, determine how things are going to go. But I do think the basic training that we get, added in with the pre-deployment the pre training, gives us a pretty good uh, basis to go on. And then we just have to make it up on the ground. And I think New Zealanders are pretty good at working with other nations. Uh, and that helps us. We can see there that the living and working conditions are variable within a mission. Even some people are within the same mission. You're always going to suffer from isolation and you're going to have to always deal with different levels of competence and motivation. I think the missions uh, you know, are, are more not just the NZDF anymore, the NZ Inc. Uh, and we do rely a lot on NGOs and other agencies to help make, make a difference. So, you know, peacekeeping is still a, a job that soldiers can do, but our job is probably more on conventional type operations, but we have the kit and the ability to do these sort of things. But I also believe to have a proper result, it's got to be more than just armed forces uh, involved in the mission. So um, I'm going to finish with a whakatauki. Uh, Paiko was a warrior, uh, and whenever war broke out in his rohi, he was always called up, uh, maybe he's like Achilles, we had a Greek scholar here yesterday, um, and he would always respond. Anyway, he and others got invited to a feast, and as all the other rangatira all invited in to partake of the feast, suddenly he realised, hey, they've forgotten about me, he didn't get an invite, so rather than go in and break the tikanga, he shouted out this, and essentially, it's probably the Tereo version of this kind of thing here, you know. When in danger and the foe is nigh, you know, God and soldiers, the nation cry. Now, on the eve of Anzac, I'm certainly not going to suggest that members of the Defence Force and others that have been on operations are, are all forgotten about and overlooked. No, not at all. I just think it's sometimes it's an internal factor, and, and we as individuals, that can be our own worst enemy, um, and... It makes conversations about your experiences quite difficult. And, you know, I think already you all know more about what I did overseas than actually my wife and my family do. Yeah, true. And many of my colleagues. So yeah. thank you all for your attention and, uh, and everything. And, uh, well, I think I'm the last speaker of the day. So, uh, But I do look forward to the questioning. And uh, I thank again the organisers for providing me, but all of us, the opportunity to share our thoughts, ideas and experiences. Thank you very much.